Gracious Lord, we are thankful to come before you again tonight with thanksgiving in our hearts for what we know that thou hast done and for faith to believe that you will continue to do for us the exceeding abundantly. I thank you for what anchored in my heart in that emergency room just now upon those poor, sick, and dying people. I believe you stopped death just a few moments ago, Lord. I am happy for that. God, I pray that you'll stop death and sickness over this building tonight everywhere. May there not be a feeble one in our midst at the end of the service. Give us victory, Father. Bless your people everywhere. Bless the ministers, your shepherds of the flock. We pray that you'll encourage their hearts greatly. Go forward, Lord, preaching the full manifestation of the Spirit. Grant it, Lord. Bless every church and every person. Get glory unto thyself. Here are many little parcels laying here, Father. There are handkerchiefs and little pieces of goods that they've laid up here to be prayed over. We're taught in the Bible that, that they've taken from the body of St. Paul, handkerchiefs and aprons. And evil spirits went out of the people and they were healed of diseases. And we're not St. Paul, but you're still Jesus. And, and I pray, Father, that as the people had faith to do this, give us faith to believe that their requests will be answered. May every disease that these handkerchiefs represent, may it flee from the person as soon as the handkerchief is placed on them. Save the lost tonight, Father. Heal the sick. Give glory unto thyself, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We are very happy indeed to be back in the building tonight with our uh, brethren and with you people here for the kingdom of God's sake. Trusting tonight that we'll have a great victory tonight. I feel that we will somehow. And I, we had a wonderful time last evening. The power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I just simply rejoice all. Couldn't hardly sleep after I got home just to think of the presence of the Lord. Just beating out the enemy, bringing in the victory. And seeing the people go into it, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And great things taking place. The glory of God upon the people. Uh, that's encouraging to me. You know, I used to uh, pastor a, a First Baptist Church at Milltown, Indiana. I stayed with some people out in the country when I would be down there for my use as kind of a circuit like. And I'd hold a revival and I used to stay with some people named Wright. And I was always amazed. I don't know where you have them here or not. The Nightingale or Mockingbird. And our country's full of them. I thought they followed me all over the United States. Everywhere I go, they follow. I go out to cut my grass in the yard by turn my radio on. That's the nightingales and mockingbirds and all the birds singing. I, I think that's God's radio, the best I ever heard in my life, I, is to hear the birds. And uh, most boys throw rocks at birds. But I imagine these two sitting on the front seat wouldn't throw rocks at birds. <laughs> No, sir. And be sure not to throw rocks at my little robins, you see. Yeah, a robin is my bird. Did you ever see him with the red breast? You know how they got red? I tell you. So you won't throw no rocks at him. One day there was a man dying on a cross. Everybody had left him. His hands was nailed in the cross. The briny tears and the blood running from his face. Spinning out over his body. And he was nailed there. And a little bird, a little brown bird, felt so sorry for him. He kept flying into his hands and trying to pull the nails out. Flying into his feet and trying to pull the nails out. You know what happened? He got his little breast all red with blood. And since then, he's had a red breast. You don't want to throw no rocks at him, do you? No, no. And I just hope that when I go to meet him, too, that my covering will be blood over the breast, too, trying to pull the nails out. <clears throat> I think we all feel that way, don't we? It's my sins that put him there. I wish I had some way I could take it off, but he had to die for me. 
His old nightingales used to sit out down there and sing at night time. And as I would come in, I studied the nightingale. I like to study nature. You know, I love nature. And I was studying on the nightingale. Sometimes on a real stormy night, he'll sit out there and he'll just keep looking up. And as soon as he can see the black clouds go by, if he can get his eye on one little star, he'll start singing because he knows the sun's just shining somewhere. It's reflecting the sun, the star, the moon, and so forth. So as long as I can see a good meeting like last night, I can just keep on singing because I know the sun's are shining somewhere to see it reflecting back to the earth, the glory of God. Now, you that's got your Bibles and would like to read with me, let's turn to St. John, the first chapter. And now, tomorrow night, I hope that every... Uh, Christian brings a sinner friend with them tomorrow night. If the Lord's willing, I trust that tomorrow night will be the night that the Spirit will grant the things that I've been praying for so hard since I've been in the meeting. And then Sunday afternoon, we're our closing of this campaign, and I'll say that it's been a great time for me, a wonderful time. I've certainly enjoyed this day that I've waited so long to come to Yakima. And if you don't have no church to go to, and your church isn't having service Sunday afternoon, be sure to tan with us. And we'd be glad to have you. To pray with us, help us along. Your presence means a whole lot to us. And, and then you'll be here to pray and to help us with others. Each night we try to pray for the sick there's not too many I can stand up in the line to, especially on those visions, and I'm sure believers understand. This is just about the last round. If I get back again sometime to Yakima, I won't be praying for the sick like that. It'll be beyond that. See, It's just about the last round. I can feel it as it begin moving out. It's been completely around the world three or four times now. So it uh, won't be long until that ministry will be leaving. And it'll be a new one which will be far beyond this. And as I was sure the first time I told you this one was coming, how many is in the building heard me announce that way back in the early days? Raise up your hands wherever you are, sure. See? Way back at this one would come. Did it come? Just exactly the way you said it would do. Now there's another one coming, which will be far beyond this one. And it'll be uh, great, I'm sure. Wished I know what it was, but I don't. I just, I know it's coming. St. John, the first chapter, and let's begin at the 29th verse to read just a potion for a, to draw a text from. <clears throat> the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. On these symbols tonight, I would like to take a subject of lamb and dove. You know, a sheep is a very sensitive and odd animal. And you know, a sheep never was asked to manufacture wool. He was asked to bear wool because he is a sheep. And as long as he is a sheep, he will bear wool because that's his nature. And so is it with the Christian church. We were never asked to manufacture fruits. We were asked to bear fruits. Galatians 5 said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, faith, peace, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, patience. These are not to be manufactured. They're to be products that comes from the inside out. 
The outside life that we live proves what's on the inside. Now, we have tried to manufacture this, to manufacture the fruits of the Spirit, and we always turn out hypocrisy, because you cannot manufacture Christianity. It's an experience by Spirit that lives in you and bears fruit of itself. You cannot manufacture it. We have tried to educate it and denominate it. And when we do, we turn out hypocrisy and failure. It's not to be done that way. It's to be done as God intended to be do be done, the Spirit inside of us bearing fruits of its presence. That's God's program. It can never be changed. And this tonight is an awful unusual text, but God is unusual. And he does things in an unusual way, at an unusual time, with unusual people. He's altogether unusual. And I think this is one of the most striking instances of all the scriptures. When it so pleased God that when he wanted to symbolize his son on earth, it was called a lamb. The lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then when God was going to symbolize himself, he was represented by a dove. Now, if you notice, of all the creatures that roam the earth, there's nothing as meek and gentle as a lamb. There's nothing so innocent as a lamb. Meek, gentle. And of the dove... There's no fowl that flies the air of the heavens as meek and as gentle as the dove. It's the most sensitive bird of all the birds. And the lamb is the most sensitive of all the animals. Therefore, if you'll notice, the lamb and the dove has spirits alike and natures alike. If it would not have been that way, If there would have been a crow flew down on the lamb, the lamb could have not have stood that. And if the the dove would have flew down on a wolf, the dove could not have stood it. Their natures wasn't the same. So it had to be a lamb and a wolf, or a lamb and a dove, symbolized together, God and his son. So that they could live together. Now, I've often wondered why God ever represented us as lambs. We are the sheep of his pasture. If you notice, a lamb is one of the most unusual animals. That lamb cannot find his way back when he's lost. I've raised sheep. And let a sheep get lost, he'll stand there and bleat till he dies. He cannot find his way back. He's got to have the shepherd to lead him back. And we will never find our way back to any other way but to the shepherd. The human race lost. It needs to be shepherded back. We cannot find our way back through educational programs. We cannot find our way back through science. We cannot find our way back to religions. There's only one way back, and that's by the shepherd. The dove. He is a very unusual bird. A dove is the only bird that we know of that doesn't have a gall. A dove has no gall at all. All the other birds have gall. But he has no gall, so in the dove is no bitterness. 
And in God is no bitterness. Or in the one that the dove lives in and leads, there's no bitterness. Now, the dove, the reason he's made like that is because of his diet. Now, he could not eat the things that a vulture eats because it would kill him right away. And another thing I'd like to speak about the dove right here is that a dove is one of the most cleanest birds there is in far the heavens. There's nothing as clean as a dove. And he doesn't have to watch about it. His body puts out an oil that goes to his feathers and constantly keeps him clean. Oh, what a symbol that the believer has got an oil of the Spirit that lives in him. Keeps his feathers clean. The dust and thing doesn't bother a dove. His little body is oily. And it keeps the dust and things away. It just constantly flows. And as he flies, the dust flies away from him. It cannot stick on him. Because this certain oil comes from him for that purpose and dirt cannot stick on him. What a symbol. Oh, God, fill my lamp tonight with that kind of oil. That the world and all of its pleasures and its riches and its uh, great glamour will not stick to us. That we'll be able to throw it off through an oil that comes from the inside working out to keep the church clean. As the old song used to go, give me oil in my lamp, keep me shining. God puts holy oil inside. Oil in the Bible represents the spirit. Keeping the church clean. And yet a dove is a fowl. He's a, just a bird. And the dove is represented in the Bible all the way from Genesis to Revelation. I've studied the bird very much. In our country and most all the states in the Union, he's a sacred bird. They're not allowed to hunt him. But in some states they are allowed to hunt him. I could never shoot one. But he's a sacred bird in our state. They'd give you a hundred dollars, fine, just as soon as you'd kill one. He's a sacred bird. Now, in the ark, the dove and the crow sat on the same roost. Both of them were birds. One could fly where the other one flew. One could do just anything the other one could do. But when they were turned loose... To take their choice. They turned the dove loose first. And the little fella flew about. And the Bible said she could find no rest for the soles of her feet. Every time she could find something to sit on, it was a dead carcass. An old dead something of the world and she could not light on that. Why, it was against her nature. And if a man is ever born with that spirit on the dove in him, I don't say he won't leave, something might happen, he'll fly loose somewhere. But if he really had that dove spirit, he'll find no rest for the soul that's in him. Backslider, you're the most miserable person in the world. You can't find pleasure anywhere. You'll sound like your testimony, like Peter said. To whom should we go? Where can we go? You're the only one that has the words of eternal life. And a real born-again Christian sometimes might get angry at something done in the church. It'll poison his system. But if he's a real dove, he'll come back just as sure as God's in heaven. He'll do it. Because there's something in him. That won't let him light on them old dead carcasses out to a rock and roll party or a beer joint. They simply stink to him. To any born again Christian, he just can't stand it because he has no gall in him to digest such a thing. 
Yes. But when they turned the crow loose, oh, he was just as happy as he could be, flying from one dead carcass to the other and eating his stomach full. That's the way crows do. And a crow is a hypocrite. I'm glad they got open season on him everywhere. And he is an awful fella, long-lifed, but he can sit down on an old dead carcass and eat just as much as he wants to and fly right out in the field and eat wheat with the dove. But the dove eating wheat cannot fly back and eat with him. So a hypocrite can go to church and shout and carry on and put their name on the book, go out and enjoy card games, drinking, smoking, dancing, rock and roll, and all those things, and come back to church and eat food from the church. I wondered about that one time. I saw a vision. It's made manifest how that the, a man went forth sowing wheat when he slept. But then an enemy come forth and sowed terriers, which is scriptural. And when the wheat come up and it got ripe, the weeds is up also, the terriers. And when there come a drought, and when the drought come, everybody was praying for rain. And a great black cloud come and rained down, and the little wheat had its head down like this. It brought its little head up and began to say, Oh, glory to God. Praise be to the Lord for sending the rain. And the little weed jumped up just the same as the wheat did and said, Glory to God, hallelujah, for sending the rain. I said, Now I don't know what to think. Then I see then again that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The rain was sent for the wheat, but the terriers being in there got the benefit of it, the same rain. But by their fruit you shall know them, said Jesus. Amen. It isn't how much we join church and how loyal we are to this, that, or the other. It's the fruit of the Spirit that counts and tells the man or the woman what they are. Something inside of them. Not manufactured, but they're bearing it. The life that was in Christ is in you. Shows itself. Jesus said, these signs will follow them that are that believe. Something not manufactured, educated to theologies, but a spirit of the Holy Ghost in the human heart, bearing the fruits and the evidence of his resurrection and his living power. Oh, yes, the dove is a sweet bird. I've had a lot of dealings with them. One time when I went to pray for Florence Nightingale, her great-grandmother founded the Red Cross. And you got our picture here in the book called Prophet Visits Africa by Julius Stadsklin. And when I went into London, the plane stopped and I heard them paging me and the, they had all the escort out there. And someone said, there's a lady dying over here in a plane just been brought in from South Africa. Well, I, I couldn't go over there. I couldn't get through the crown. And I had some one to go over and say we would take her to some other place as soon as I'd uh, went and done my duties for being there, prayed uh, to pray for the king and so forth. I come back to the Piccadilly Hotel and then they could meet me there. And when I went to the room to this woman, she wrote me a letter. Miss Florence Nightingale and wanted me to come pray for her. I couldn't do it. She only weighed about 60 pounds. And if you'll notice the picture, we had to put something across it this way to get the picture. Brother Lindsay did that because it was just a small a string of a clout over her. Her limbs were just about that big around, up around the hip. The veins had collapsed. Why the woman was living, I do not know. I went into the room and she's in a parish just behind the church. And she's had two nurses and I said, are you Miss Nightingale? And I looked at her jaws had sunk in, her cheekbones out and that kind of like the square part of the skull where it laces together was showing. No flesh at all. And she started to cry. And I wondered where there could even be enough moisture. that she could cry, she took glucose and all of her bowels was wound up with cancer in her stomach. How the woman was living, I don't know. I couldn't understand a thing. She was moving her lips. And the nurse got down to see what she said. 
And she said, I have Brother Branham to pray to God to let me die. Oh, I tried to get a hold of her hand and the nurse picked up her arm and laid that dead form of bones and sinew in my hands, cold as it could be and the knuckles and joints just holding together. What a feeling of a human being laying like that. I could not pray for her to die when I was there praying for the sick to get well. So I asked the ministers, there's seven or eight in the room, and I said, let us kneel down. And in England, if anyone's ever been there, when the fog comes in, you just can't see nothing. And that was a very foggy day. You know, the cab had to just go right along as easy as he could to get through the fog. And there had been a great wave of it come in. We were near the coast. And it was so foggy, I could just see there was a tree standing by the window. When I knelt down by the side of the window, the sill was about that far up, even with my face. And I started to pray. And as I started to pray, Almighty God, the author of everlasting life, the giver of all good gifts, send upon this poor dying creature here thy blessings. Just as I started to pray, a little dove flew in from somewhere, sat down on this sill, began walking back and forth, cooing, just about one foot from where my face was praying. And I thought it was a pet there at the house. I'd just been in England about four or five hours, and I thought maybe it's just a pet at the house, and it walked to and fro up and down this little uh, sill. And then when I finally prayed and said amen and raised up, the little dove flew away, and I was going to say, was that a pet dove? And the ministers was talking about what was that dove doing there? Well, I said, isn't it a pet dove? And they said, no, they've never seen it before. And I turned around to look at the woman. There standing before me stood a strong, healthy woman. I said, thus saith the Lord, you'll live and not die. Turn the next page in the book and look at her a year later. She's nursing now in England. Strong, healthy God in the form of a dove sitting at the window, sent his messenger. You know my story, my little girl, my wife, when they died, every evening I'd go out there for a long time at the grave and sit up there. Oh, I just couldn't give them up hardly. I was just a boy and all my family gone, just Billy and I left. And I'd, I'd go out there and sit at the grave. And every afternoon, just as sure as it got around about five o'clock, here come an old turtle dove flying through the brush, set up in one of them old cedar trees out there and just coo and sing. I'd raise up my hands and praise the Lord and sound like the wind coming down through them bushes and saying, there's a land beyond the river that they call the sweet forever. And we only reached that shore by faith degree. One by one we gain the portal there to dwell with the immortal. Someday they'll ring those golden bells for you and me. A little dove queen. I first thought it must be the immortal soul of, of my little girl. But if it had been her, she'd come talk to me. But the dove, God represented himself in being a dove. Now, the lamb. Now the dove puts out an oil to keep himself clean. And the lamb has lanolin to keep the weather off of him. And we are likened unto God's lamb. I want you to notice what kind of a lamb this was. This lamb, a lamb, has to be led. And this precious lamb that we're thinking about, he was led. Not my will thine be done. Led to the slaughter. Sometimes they... Someone said, why was Jesus uh, led to the Calvary? You know, the Bible said they led him away. Put a rope around his neck and led him away. Why? He was a lamb of God. Why was he born in a manger? Because he was a lamb. He had to be born in the barn. He was a lamb. Born to lamb and led to the slaughter. Did you ever go around a slaughter pen? When they go to slaughter sheep, what leads them up to the slaughter block? A goat. They have a goat there that will lead these sheep till he gets right up there to a certain place and he'll jump off and let the sheep go on in. That's what's always been. That's what led him to his slaughter. The goat. 
And the sh- well, if you ever come time, the slaughters has told me the butchers they butch him, said they had to kill the goat. Then he really kicked up a fuss. But he wants to lead the sheep always to the slaughter. That's the way the devil does it. He's always trying to lead God's people to the slaughter. Amen. The roadhouse, the nightclub, somewhere. Won't you notice, not only that, but he was a willing lamb. A willing lamb. A lamb only has one thing. And that's his fur. Wool on him. But he he's a willing lamb. All that he's got, he's willing to forfeit that. He forfeits his wool. That's the only thing that he has. But yet for your sake and my sake, he forfeits what he's got. Now, if we call ourselves lambs, lambs of God, we're willing to forfeit our ideas to follow God. We are willing to. But, oh, we Americans can't be led. No. Oh, sir, we went away to school and we learned how to lead. We can't be led. We learned our Ph.D. and double L.D. and so forth. And we know all about it. And we know how to lead. So the dove can't lead us when we got that kind of an attitude. Why, we can't be led. We got to lead the people. But God's got one leader from as far as church. And that's the dove. The Holy Spirit is the leader of God's people. The leader. But when we get to know so much... We know so much theology, then the Lamb can't lead us because it's against our ideas and we just won't put up with it. You've got to forfeit your idea. People say, oh, the days of miracles is past. We learned that in school. While well, we know there's, there, there's no such a thing as divine healing, there's no Holy Ghost like the Pentecostal people say they got. Them days is past. I learned that in school. How's God going to lead you then? Do you believe such a thing as that? How's God going to heal you when you think the days of miracles is past? He just can't do it. So, then we go along and say, well, yet we got churches and we got great organizations and denominations, but all having a form of godliness, but denying the dove thereof. <laughs> the dove that does the leading. We have our religions and we have our ideas and we don't want nothing mixed up with it. They say, I don't care what the Bible says. I've had people tell me that many times. A fellow not long ago, a student told me, said, I don't care how many healing you would produce. I still do not believe it. I said, certainly it wasn't for unbelievers. It was for believers. That's the only one's for for them to believe it. It never was intended for unbelievers. And God can only lead a man as he'll let him lead. God can only work with anyone that will let him work with him. I always felt sorry for God trying to find somebody he could lead and work through. I sat long ago reading of Samson and how that that man, he was something like a lot of today, a ladies' man, and God could never use him. He was willing to submit his strength to the Lord, but never willing to give his heart to the Lord. Now he had a great strength. And many churches today will land their strength to the Lord. Oh, sure, we'll build an organization that'll put a million in and do all this, that, the other. But they're never willing to surrender your heart for divine leadership of the Holy Spirit to lead us to the fountains of waters of life. We're never willing to do it. Seems like it's the hardest thing for people to get in their head that the Holy Spirit leads. Sons and daughters of God are led by the Spirit of God. Not bishops and cardinals and so forth by the Spirit of God. That was God's idea. If you're a lamb, you're led by the Spirit of God. But I wonder sometime in the face of all this, if God could lead us. I wonder if we haven't turned out to be goats instead of sheep. The dove couldn't lead a goat. He would lead. No, no, he wants to lead. The goat will lead, but you can't lead him. And I may tell you something, brother. You'll certainly have to be a very smart shepherd if you can hear the blading of a goat and the blading of a sheep and tell them apart. They both sound almost the same. And the Bible said that the devil in the last days here would be so shrewd that it would deceive the very elected if it was possible. How shrewd Satan will come in. Just watch what's fixing to take place now in the last days. Watch these lectures and things coming up. Watch how Satan will pull that, try to pull that wool. He tried it once before and failed. He'll try until he succeeds in doing it. 
He'll do it. Yes, sir, he'll do it. And remember, I predicted that in 1933. And it will be that way, too. For I saw a vision before the end time. That great, powerful thing stood up in the United States and should become a stubble. So then, it's going to happen. I said automobiles will become like a shape of an egg. You know what a 33 car looked like. And I said they'll even be traveling on the road. They won't even have to guide it. They've already got that out. I see it here not long ago. It'll be controlled by electronics like uh, by a magnet post to cut their speed and so forth. The razor speed. They can't hit against one another and so forth. And I've got that wrote in a book since 1933. And it'll be that way. We're coming to it now. We're right in it. Because... The Holy Spirit is the one that leads the church and warns us of dangers that is to come. Now, we find in our churches today things that goes on. Now, it used to be a long time. I don't get angry with me now. I want to show you. Now, we're talking about out in denominations. Now, we're going to come home to Pentecost just a little bit. We're going to wonder what's happening to our Pentecostal people. You know, it used to be a horrible thing for our women to cut their hair. It used to be awful. I can remember that. I've only been with them just a few years. But now, it's all right. They cut their hair. And the Bible said that the hair on a woman was for her glory. And the Bible said that if a woman cuts her hair, she dishonors her head, which is her husband. And she cuts her hair, her husband then has a right to put away that dishonorable woman. That's Paul's teachings in Corinthians. You argue with him. I know that hurts. Mama used to take us and she used to tell me, she said, every Saturday night we'd have to, an old cedar tub would take a bath in and I was the oldest one and they ate, got a bath in that same tub for me and they just put a little more hot water in it. And then every Saturday night, the way we had to eat, we had to take a dose of castor. I can't stand it yet today. And I'd come to her just gagging and holding her nose and I said, Mom, I can't stand this stuff. She said, if it doesn't make you right sick, it don't do you any good. And that's why preaching the gospel, if it doesn't sicken you up a little bit, do something to you. It doesn't do you much good. But that's the truth. A lot of our Pentecostal women's got so that they're wearing these little bitty old clothes to mow the yard and things in. Pentecostal women letting their young girls out doing that. They talk about juvenile delinquency. It's parent delinquency. What's the matter? Then talk about the literacy of Kentucky. Some of them old mammies out there let their daughter come in the way some of the women do. Five o'clock in the morning and messed up over their face and their hair, bulled out like that. She'd take a limb off a hickory tree and she'd take the rest of the clothes off her and hide with it. And then call that illiteracy. <laughs> God knows we need some more mammies like that. Amen. That's exactly right. And our women got to a place smoking cigarettes. You say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. That's my American privilege. I know, but if you're a lamb, you'll forfeit it. Well, I belong to certain sorts of church, all right? If you're a lamb, you'll forfeit your privileges. Well, I see all the other... Yeah, that's right. But you're different. If you're a Christian, you've got to be different. Some lady said, I don't wear shorts, I wear slacks. I said, that's worse. Right. The Bible said it's an abomination for a woman to put on a garment that pertains to a man. I spoke that in one of the meetings on this. The woman wrote me a big, long letter. She said, now, wait. Said, you're getting off on to man-made doctrine. Said, what's a woman going to do when she's out riding a horse in a mosquito-vested area, rounding up cattle? I just told her back. I said, that's not a woman's job. If she'd keep her place, she wouldn't have to be out there. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Trouble of it is now, I love our sisters, and that's right. I think they're fine, but they ought to know their places. And, you know, I remember when it used to be a horrible thing for our Pentecostal women to put on this manicure, you know, on their faces. Um, I got that wrong. I always get that wrong. What it, make, makeup. Makeup. Uh, manicures and fingernails. Is that right? I don't know anything about that stuff. But um, makeup. It used to be wrong for a woman to put on painted makeups. But now they do it. You know... An old Methodist minister used to sing a song, we let down the bars, we let down the bars, we compromise with sin, we let down the bars, the sheep got out, but how did the goats get in? <laughs> you just let down the bars. Many times, not these brethren, but many times, preachers think more of a meal ticket than they do the gospel. Evangelists go across and be ashamed, my evangelist told me a note evangelist the other day, he said, you're going to hurt your ministry. I said, any 
anything that'll hurt, if my ministry is hurt by preaching the truth, it ought to be hurt. Right? He said, you'll make the people angry and they won't give you nothing. I said, I didn't ask them for anything. I said, the thing of it is that at the day of the judgment, that's where I'm going to have to answer. Listen, sister, there was only one woman in the Bible ever painted her face. And she didn't paint it to meet God, she painted it to meet man. And her name was Jezebel. That's right. You know what God did for her? He fed her to the dogs. So when you see a woman all painted up, you can say, how to do, Miss Dog Meat? That's just exactly what she is before the Lord. That's exactly. Well, you say other women does it, but if you're a lamb, forfeit your rights. God wants you to live like a woman ought to live, like a lady ought to live. It's getting so... Time of the war, I went up, I was a game warden, I was going up the forestry, and there was, sat down back there was some man, he was a welder. And I, well, it's the dirtiest jokes I ever heard. I, I was even embarrassed to sit down with all a bunch of men. And so, this fellow looked around at me and he said, cold out there? I said, yes it is. He said, are you a game warden? I said, yes sir, I am. And come to find out, sitting there beside, it was a woman welder. Overhauls on, greasy, big pair of goggles on the top, rough, drink like a man, smoke like a man, cuss like a man. God don't intend that to be that way. God wants a woman, when God made a man first, he made him both male and female in spirit. He made him in his own image and God is a spirit. When he separated him and put him in flesh, he put the masculine spirit in a man and a feminine spirit in a woman. And if anything's contrary to that, there's a bit of perversion there. Exactly. You see a woman trying to act like a man, there's a little something wrong there. The cell's crossed up somewhere. That's right. You see a man so sissified that he won't preach against sin or nothing else like that to hurt somebody's feeling. There's a cross up there somewhere too. Not only his natural birth, but spiritual birth. <laughs> oh, what we need today is that a man be a man, a woman a lady. God intended to be that way, dressed different. Say, you're hammering us women, now I'm going to tell you about the man. Any man that'll let his wife smoke cigarettes and wear them shorts and act like that, there's very little man in him, to my opinion. That's right. I've got my opinion of a man who let his wife do that. I, I sure have. Well, what's the matter, you say? Well, brother, here's what it is. Man is not measured by strength this way. Or say, that guy's a man. He's six foot tall, got muscles that big. I've seen him, many of them weigh 200 pounds, six foot and a half tall, didn't have an ounce of man in him. Throw a baby out of a mother's arms and ravish her. Man's not measured. That's brute. That's brute. Strength is. Man's measured by character. There never was a man like Jesus Christ. Never measured up to him. And the Bible said there's no beauty. We should desire him. Didn't look like a king. His little bitty fellow probably stooped. A little small in statue. But there never was a man like him. Man is measured by character. Not by brutal strength. Well, you say, Brother Brandon, the rest of them does it. I don't care what the rest of them does. If you've got that gall of bitterness in you, there's something wrong somewhere. If you can stomach the world and still say that you're a Christian, there's something wrong somewhere. I was just eating dinner. There was two fellows sitting there, ministers. Collars turned around in the back. And they sat there and drank three or four cocktails. Wife and I and the family sat there and looked at them. Told a few little smutty jokes to one another. Got through eating and pulled out a great big cigar like a, looked like a dehorned Texas steer sitting there smoking on that thing. Do you mean to tell me that the dove would lead that? No, sir. That dove is holy. Hallelujah. Putting out holy oil. A goat might do that, but not a lamb. The fruit of the spirit. That's no fruit of the spirit. People go to rock and roll. Dancing, RYMCA's in Dorset, and teach rock and roll. Many of our church groups take the basement floor or something like this, a recreation room, and teach their people rock and roll. And the thing's born out of hell. It's an African dance. Painting of the face is a heathen trait. In Africa, I'm a missionary. Them people back there that never know right and left hand, watch them women, how they paint with mud and everything. It's exactly right. It's heathen. It's the devil. And it creeps into our churches. And we then call ourselves the lambs of God. I'm telling you. 
we need to find the dove again. Now you say, well, that's wrong. You preach that in your church. Some of them say, oh, I, I'll never go back again. Snort like a wolf. What does a lamb do? What does a dove do if you snort like a wolf? He takes his flight. I won't listen to that anymore. My pastor getting so... Well, the dove just flies right away. That's exactly right. He will not stay where the world's mixed up because he can't stand the smell of it. He can't stand it. He can't eat it. He can't tolerate with it. And when you go to mix it with the world, then the dove takes its flight. And when churches begin to say the days of miracles is past, there's no such a thing as divine healing. All that must be mental something. That's the devil uh, doing those miracles and performing those signs. It's all the devil. Just remember right now, the dove takes its flight. For the dove feeds on dove food. And shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's my own American privilege to do as I want to. If I want a little sociable drink with a neighbor, if I want to go out to this and do that, that's my own privilege. That's right. It is your privilege. Now, if you're born just of the national spirit, you'll keep on doing it. If you're born to the heavenly spirit, you won't do it no more. That's right. If the church just means a denomination to you, you'll live right in the church and go right on. It's the same and put up with it. But if you are a nature of a lamb, you cannot stand it. Amen. Could you ever imagine, I see a lamb out in the field eating alfalfa. And he's out there eating alfalfa. Here's a, a pig over here eating on a dead horse. Could you imagine the, the pig saying, come over, Mr. Lamb, and eat a little with me? Why, the lamb couldn't do it if he had to. Now, I don't blame sinners from doing those things. They're a pig anyhow. That's nothing. I just let them go ahead. You see them out there drinking and carrying on and... Cursing, telling dirty jokes and smutty things and acting unworld, uh, worldly and saying, I don't believe in no such a thing as divine healing. Well, sure, that's all right. He's a pig anyhow. Didn't strange see him on an old dead carcass, the old vulture. But what surprises me to see a man that claims that he loves the Lord Jesus and then do a thing like that. Yeah. Wow. That's right. There's something wrong somewhere. Yeah. Something went wrong somewhere. Because if that dove, before that dove will ever come into that lamb, it has to be a lamb or he won't come into it. He might manufacture something like it and pretend that he's a Christian. But if he is a Christian, he'll agree with every word that that dove wrote in here. He'll be led by the word of God. Yeah. Now, we snort and blow up. Huh, no such a thing as divine healing. I went on one of them old meetings. You better keep away from there. That's of the devil. That guy's a fortune teller. They hoodoo them people. That's all there is to it. That's the same old devil that said it's Beelzebub. Yeah. The same old devil. He's trying to keep you away from it. Test it with the Word. God tests everything by the Word. Sheep food is the Word of God. His lambs feed in this shady green pasture. Now, we wonder today why we can't have a revival. Why can't we have a revival? What's the matter we can't have? It's because we follow the wrong wrong leadership. We can have some manufactured uh, conversions and protracted meetings. But when it comes to a real revival... What's the matter? We're letting too much world creep into our churches. Brother, you minister. You believe that? Amen. There's too much world in our churches. If we're a Pentecost, let's be Pentecost. Amen. Let's act like Pentecost. Amen. Let's live like Pentecost. Amen. Let's live for the Pentecost of blessing Amen. and do the things that Pentecost promised us. Amen. We don't need Pente- Pentecost. is not a denomination. Pentecost is an experience. Amen. That's when you become a lamb and the dove gets a hold of you and starts leading you. That's when we are our Pentecost. That's what happened up there when God sent up his lamb and he, he died for our sins and, and then the dove came back down on the day of Pentecost and led the church the same Holy Spirit that came up on the first lamb of Jordan. That's the same one it leads today. And now when you go to start and send, I'm so and so, I belong to this denomination. We don't believe in no such thing as that. Now how is the gentle Holy Spirit going to ever feed you then? Then there's something wrong with if a goat would stand for that, but not a sheep. A sheep, a lamb, is God's child. The Holy Spirit leads God's children. And today, what we need today is another experience. What we need today is a recoming again of the dove and settling up on the church and leading it and opening up our eyes and getting inside of us so we can see the manifestations of His presence. Oh, if we could all, everyone in here, just set aside the old goaty dowdy feeling away from us. And let the dove come in tonight. And when the dove feel it flutter out into your heart, take its place, 
It hasn't gone very far. It's just sitting up there on the roof somewhere waiting for you to come back. It didn't go very far. It'll come right back. You remember when we used to have prayer meetings years ago and pray all night long? You remember that meetings? Yes, amen. You remember when they used to be the old-fashioned? I've heard what they call then the holy rollers. They'd get out on the street corner and preach and pray and them ladies with them long skirts on standing there beating a tambourine and face and hair pulled back like a peeled onion. Uh, oh, but do you think one of these new we love Susie lookers would ever go on the street like that? I should say not. And then trying to say that she's a lamb. You old goat. What's the matter, ain't it? That's right. What we need today is some more lambs that can be led and feed on the Word of God. I'll dress the way I want to. That's my business. No, it isn't. It's God's business. I'll take care of my family the way I want to. Preacher, you got a business. Tell me that. Yes, I have too. You ought to take care of it the way a God told you to take care of it. That's right. Stop all this nonsense. But we don't do it. You see what it is? We let down the bars. What happened? The Holy Spirit took its flight. When you started acting like that, the Holy Spirit left. And that's the reason when he comes back into the church, you just wonder what's the matter. See, it, it, it's not nothing. If, uh, you say, well, maybe I wouldn't get out and do this, that, or the other. Guilty the least is guilty the whole. You've got to surrender yourself to God and let the Holy Spirit lead you. Amen. What is sin anyhow? Sin is unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. That's right. We are sinners because we're not believers. I, well, them priests back there in those days that Jesus called sinners and vipers and snakes of grass and the father was a devil and so forth. Those men led just as clean as they could walk. But they was led by their church. If the Holy Spirit would have been leading them, they would have known him. He said, if you would have known my father, you would have known me anyhow. If I do not the works of my father, then believe me not. For the, the dove was in him. And the dove was making the manifestation. Here it comes. Get ready. And the dove in us today will produce the same thing it did in that lamb. Same ministry. Same signs. Same wonders. He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. More than this shall he do because I go unto my Father. A little while the world seeth me no more yet you shall see me for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. Oh, what a confirmation to see a lamb and dove come together, heaven and earth united, God and man united, and while the, the sins of the world was kissed away and, and all roughness and all death and all sorrow and all sickness was kissed away when the lamb and the dove become united together. And it'll do the same thing to you when it unites with you, when the dove and the lamb comes together, their natures are the same. Now, can you see why people say ministers, the great big clergy names and so forth, of, of honorable father, doctor, so-and-so, that how it is they say, oh, that, that, don't believe that divine healing stuff. Don't believe that holy roller stuff like that Pentecostals. Don't believe that. You see, it's a goat instead of a lamb. See, they eat on the word of God is the food for the lamb. God leads them. And the way he led that first lamb, what if Jesus raised up and said, Now, wait a minute, Moses was a great prophet. That's the truth. But them days are gone. That wouldn't have been the lamb. Wouldn't have been the lamb of God. No, sir, he always vindicated that it's not me that doeth the works. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do the works of my Father, you can't believe me. Believe the works. That's why the lamb was the leading. It was God in him. It's God in the church. It's God in these people today. It's God making himself manifested through the Holy Spirit living in the church on his lambs. Do you believe that with all your heart? Let us bow our heads just a moment. Dove and lamb. While you're listening, the most outstanding scriptures, one of them that I can think of, when Jesus said, Father, think of it. Father, for their sake, I sanctify myself. Think of it. Father, for their sake, I sanctify myself. What was he doing? Setting the example. He was a lamb. What did he do? He had a right to a home. He was a man. He had a right to be married. He was a man. He had a right to good clothes. He was a, a man. But he sanctified himself. He forfeited it. He could have he come down the quarters of glory, a full statued man, with an angelic band. Sure. 
But he sanctified himself. He could have at least been born in a nice clean bed somewhere. But he's born in a manger over a manure pile. In a barred manger. But he sanctified himself. Why? He was a lamb. See, friends, we got back to assembly line religions and so forth. And all these things were getting away from the real thing. Humble yourself. Keep humble. Lord, sanctify me. Jesus is training some man that's going to take the gospel to all the world. Twelve men. So he lived a sanctified life and forfeit every worldly pleasure for their sake. We ought to forfeit our worldly dressing and our worldly pleasures and things like that for the sake of the people we're trying to lead to God. The outside world. Let the dove come in tonight. Sanctify yourself and the dove of real faith will come in and take his abode. Our Heavenly Father, this message of lamb and dove, how the lamb, a little innocent fellow, has to be led. He doesn't try to use his own thinking. He must be led. He was made that way so a shepherd could lead him. Oh, God, take all the bigness out of us. Take all the high-headed and the, and the haughty feelings and the know-it-all. Take it out of us, Lord. All the doubt and discrepancy that has crept in. Take it out, Lord. Let the dove fly down tonight. Come into every heart. That we might forfeit our rights. We might forfeit all the things that we feel as American citizens we have the right to. Let's forfeit it. That the dove might lead us to peace and goodness and mercy and glory of God. Father... I yield myself to you tonight for this healing service coming on. Let the dove fly down, Lord. Let him come into my heart, into my mouth, into my mind, into my eyes, my voice. And let them out there, Lord, know that it's you. Let him come into them. And together may he condemn sin. Condemn sickness, all the attributes of sin. May it flee tonight. May this church walk out of here tonight as a scour out, sanctified, filled up, believing church, full of the Holy Ghost. Go forth from this night on, Lord, and a great revival break out through the country that we're praying for. May we see souls around the altars again in the revival, fires are burning. Every church packed till they have to build new churches. Sunday school rooms put on. Oh, God, grant it tonight. Hear the coming of the Lord Jesus, for we believe that it's soon at hand. Let us forfeit everything worldly that we might find Christ in our lives. Be led by His Spirit. Grant it, Lord. Now, I know this little message kind of chopped up me, holding my voice back from being hoarse. I pray that somehow it'll catch hold tonight from right here on this spot. Something deep and solid and sound. That every person in here will be a fruit barrier. Not try to manufacture anything or make up anything, but just yield themselves to the Holy Spirit. And may they bear the fruit of faith and peace and joy and goodness and mercy and temperance and all the good gifts of God. May there come into the churches prophecy, speaking with tongues, interpretations, knowledge, wisdom. Grant it, Lord. May this great Pentecostal church rise and shake herself from the dust. Go to the old ways again and ask for it, Lord. And walk in it because it's a good old way. It's an old time gospel way, though talked about. Yet it's the most glorious thing that there is in the earth. Because the dove come down hunting for lambs that he can lead. God, if he could forfeit his own precious life, willingly, go to the cross as a young man and die for us. Not my will, but thine be done. God, surely, to enjoy his salvation, to enjoy eternal life through the ages that is to come, surely we can forfeit our sins and our things of the world that we might find that that he died for, that precious Lamb of God. Grant it tonight, Lord, quietly and solemnly anchored in every heart. I commit it all to you, Lord, as we call your sick children to pray. Let the stripes on that lamb tonight heal every lamb that comes into the line or is in the building. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I like the sweetness of the Holy Spirit, don't you? It just just goes way down inside me. To think of, look back at the pit where I come from. <clears throat> look back, I hate to condemn sin like I do. Uh, I, sometimes I don't mean it personally, but as a minister, I, I, uh, my office in life, I, I got to condemn it, friends. I, I can't keep from it. I don't mean to hurt anybody, but I aim to condemn it. Yes, but I want you to know it's with sweetness from my heart. God knows that. Amen. You're not long ago. I was holding a meeting in a city. I walked into a place. We've been eating across the street, a little Dunkard restaurant. It was up somewhere in Ohio. Honey, you remember where it was at? I forget. It was somewhere up in Ohio there. It was in a big army building. It was packed out and thousands of people. They kept me out in the country because there's so many down there no where I was living. And it went out in the country and we'd eating across a little Dunkard restaurant. Very nice, clean little ladies walking around there and so nice and everything. And so then Sunday they closed up and went to church. And I hadn't eaten for two days, so I had to preach that afternoon. And I went across to a modern little restaurant across the street or across the road where the highways crossed. And went over there. And when I walked in there, it was disgracefully. Standing playing the slot machine was an a officer, a police officer about my age. You know, he married. With his arm immorally around a woman playing the slot machine and gambling illegal in Ohio. There you are. I looked back across there and there sat a, some of these pretended Elvis presses like a duck sitting on the back of their head and, and uh, all that kind of nonsense hoodlums with their trousers pulled down like this and sitting there with a young girl in their arms. I just couldn't say it in a mixed audience. I looked sitting over to right there sat an elderly woman old enough to be my grandmother almost sitting there with purple stuff on her lips. And her toenails painted the same with a little pair of these little immoral clothes and a poor old thing or hide hanging down like this on her arms and set there with little blue spots on her face like this where she'd paint them with a hair that was colored blue. And I looked and I thought, oh my, and two old men sat there and it's summertime, one of the big army overcoat on, a scarf hanging down like this, sitting there with that poor old lady with beer sitting around there drinking. And one of them looked up the other and said, you think the rain will hurt the rhubarb? And they excused themselves and went to the restroom. And I stood there, I said, God, you and your holiness, how could you ever stand to look at that when it kills me to look at it? I said, why don't you strike the thing off the earth? Don't let it here no longer. I said, my little Sarah and Rebecca there had to be raised up and such as that. I said, God, strike it from the earth. You're holy. How can you do it? Something said to me, get behind the door. I went back behind the door and stood there. I waited a little bit. A vision come. I saw a world turning. And around the world was a mist that looked like blood spraying around. And I looked in there. And there I was doing things wrong. And every time I do something wrong, my sins would start before God and God would slay me for it. But Jesus is standing there like a bumper. He caught it. I'd see the tears run down his cheeks. And I'd do something else bad and his blood would hold it, keep it from, from catching me, from killing me. God would kill me. He, the day you eat there, the day you die. And I looked at it, and in the vision I went up to him. I said, Lord, I'm ashamed of myself. There laid my book laying there and all kinds of evil wrote on it. And I said, will you forgive me, Lord? Did I put you in that condition? Did my sins cause you to have to die for me? Oh, Lamb, please forgive me for my sins. I won't do that no more. He reached back, tapped his hand like this, and wrote across the book with his own blood, pardon, throw it over behind him. And then he did. He opened up a new book. I said, thank you, Lord. I'll do anything you tell me to do. I love you, Lord Jesus. He said, now, I freely forgive you for all that you've done. And then he turned and I seen the woman said, but you want to strike her off the face of the earth. Oh, I felt about that being. I said, forgive me, Lord. When the vision left me, I walked out to the little table where she was at. And I said, how do you do? And she looked up. She was half drunk. She hiccuped a couple times and said, oh, hello. And, and I said, may I sit down? She said, thank you. I have company. I said, I didn't mean it in that way. I'd just like to say a word to you. And she said, say on. And I sat down. And I said, how long have you been leading this life? She looked over at me and poor old thing. And I, I thought, my, no matter what, how, what she's went through. And I told her what had happened. I said, you pardon me. She said, are you that minister down here, Mr. Brandon? I said, I am. She reached over and got a hold of my hand, trembling, come as to crying. She said, Sir, 
She said, my husband was a preacher. She said, after his death, I have two girls. They're Sunday school teachers, both of them. And she told me the story, what happened, the way she's leading. She said, I'm past hope. I said, no, you're not. No, you're not. She said, I, I want to straighten up. But she said, I have no place to start. I said, what right now? God showed me behind the door that vision there, me wanting to strike you off. And he said, he forgave me and I want to condemn you. Lady, forgive me. There she took a hold of my hands. I let her right out there, them little old shorts on right in the middle of the, that floor like that and knelt down and we had a real prayer meeting there. When I got through, people were crying, walking around there. I tell you, brother, sometimes when you have to speak against sin, it's not to hurt the person, it's to bring them to recognize, bring them to a spot to recognize. Like our Lord, we don't mean to hurt or be bad. God knows that. That wouldn't, that, never that be in my soul. But it's to try to get people to recognize what's going on, what's happening. See, and I do this so that we'll forsake all unbelief in the things of the world and come back and be a real sweet, humble Christian and live for him. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll send the dove tonight and lead us all into that quietly and sweetly up into that real place. Elijah laid in the cave and in the cave, the wind went by, the lightning flashed, the thunders roared, the earthquake, but a still small voice attracted the prophet. God grant tonight, we, everything's went by. May that still small voice attract the people tonight to a real sanctified life. A life that'll stand by their God, that'll stand by their church, that'll stand by their pastor, that'll stand by the cause of Christ, that'll hold up a banner, that'll live, act, dress, go and associate, and live in the environment that'll be so salty that'll cause others to thirst to be like them. Grant it, Lord. May our church never get so polluted till it looks like the rest of the world. Or you can't tell sinner from saint. God grant that it'll be real. Make it real, Father. I pray as I ask for you to help us tonight and declare that you're here to back these things up. In the name of Jesus, thy son, while we have our heads bowed, is there anyone in the building tonight, or how many should I say, would like to leave that, lead that real peaceful, sweet life and be led by the lamb or by the dove? I'm not, I want everybody's head bowed and every eye closed. I'm not going to make an altar call. I just want to know your hearts. Raise up your hand and say, God bless you, all that. Look all over the building everywhere. Sure. Everywhere. Sure you do. Heavenly Father, grant it. Please do, God. There's many here. If I'd come back a year from the day, won't be here. I may not be here either, Lord, a year from the day. I've got to meet you before them all someday. And according to that vision you showed me the other day, Lord, I want every angle that I can to win somebody. Give them the desire of their heart tonight. May the dove of God lead us into deeper depths and higher heights. By the leading of the Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I believe my son told me a while ago coming in, when we met him out there, that he had uh, 50 prayer cards lined up tonight that he'd give to the people. We'll line them up and pray for them. I forgot what... See, Billy didn't see... See, one to fifty. Now, we bring these... Th the little woman's up in the check address. What, what, what part of it? Somewhere down south. Do you think of it when I'm telling you? Um, uh, it was raining real hard, and, and the place was packed, and they were standing around the walls. Um, and so they, was, Billy had give out prayer cards, and then and there was a little mother walking back and forth that had a baby in a blanket. And there's another little a little old woman sitting there in one of them little gangham dresses or what it is, you know, sitting there, a little Christian saint sitting in front. And she had, this mother had no place to, to, um, to uh, sit down with a baby. And this little mother began to feel sorry for that baby. And that little woman walking back and forth, and the Holy Spirit said to the mother, pray for that baby. Oh, she said, I couldn't ask that woman. Pray for the baby. Oh, I, I, it's best to do what God tells you to do. And so when she said, so well, next time she comes by, I'll ask her if I can pray for the baby. And when she comes by, she's packing a prayer card. Oh, she said, I wouldn't ask to pray for that baby. Well, Brother Branham's going to pray for that baby like that meant any more than anything, anybody else. She said, Brother Branham's going to pray for that baby. So the Holy Spirit kept dealing with her. And time lingered on. I hadn't come yet. And so um, then the little woman said, uh, just got so convicted, said, Sister, would you like to sit down with the baby? Oh, she said, I don't want to take your seat, dear. And probably that little mother's compassionate more for that baby than what mine would have been. And she said, 
sister said, take this seat and sit down, but said, I want to tell you, I know you're a Christian. She said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, I'm a Christian too. Said, God just kept speaking to me. Pray for that baby. Said, you got a card there. Said, uh, Brother Bram's going to pray for that baby. She said, I hope he calls my number tonight. I'm here to, with my baby and says, seriously sick. And, um, and said, I hope he calls my number. And she said, well, you sit down here and let me pray for the baby so I can just get it off my heart. Said, because I feel condemned if I don't do it. She said, well, certainly, honey, you pray for the baby. And she prayed a little prayer. They said, Lord Jesus, you was warning my heart. And I just laid my hands over on the little baby. And if it's doing wrong, when your servants to pray for it, don't, don't let it reflect, Lord. I, I'm just trying to ease my feeling. That's the Holy Spirit telling that little woman that. So she prayed for the little baby. And the woman gave the lady with the prayer card and the baby in the seat and the little lady climbed up and stood up in the balcony way up there well after a while the rain let up a little and I got in come in walked to the platform preached a little while called the prayer line and I just called about ten cards or something like that causes all to be in discernment and sometimes that way when I get down to ten I'm, I'm pretty near gone if it's a fresh meeting so then when they, they I told them I said now friends you, it's your faith you got to believe it I, so when when they called the number I believe from, from 20 to 30 or something like that or 30 to 40 whatever it was that little woman was about fourth in line that baby that little mother felt real good then so up come the little baby and the mother and the little thing had a blanket over it like this and it was real sick so it come up to where the prayer line was going on when it come up I said how do you do I got it on tape see that's how I know it all about it so I said how do you do and she said how do you do I said I suppose we're strangers one another I was trying to contact her spirit then see and um, she said, yes, sir, we are. I said, you're not here for yourself. It's for your baby. She said, that's right. I said, it's got leukemia. And she said, that is right. The doctors has just given it a few months to live. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, the baby's already healed. There's a little woman that just prayed for her. It's got a, a little gingham dress on. I said, she just prayed for the baby a few minutes ago. I said, that's her standing right there. Her name's Miss So-and-so-and-so. <laughs> she then obedience is better than sacrifice. Now that same spirit that witnessed you tonight, I am the dove, I'm here, you are my lamb, I want to heal you. Why well, just say, Shh, thank you, Heavenly Father, walk right on, I heal. That's the way it's done. All right, let's call a prayer line. I just keep talking, you're such a nice audience and set so attentive. I really appreciate that. Uh, let's see, prayer card, well, let's bring them all up and we'll just pray for them. Holy Spirit, can you just ever get a hope? You're trying hard, I know you are. See, you're trying to press into it, but if you could just, don't try to press, just let loose. <laughs> just let God do it. It'll certainly, it'll certainly be marvelous if you just let God do it. There won't be a sick person left among us. Now, if you all now will believe with all your heart, with all your strength, God will grant to you your healings. Do you believe that? I, I believe it's already taken place. <laughs> oh, it'll just keep on. Before anybody's ever got in the prayer line, I saw that light make a circle right around like I just saying. I was watching it to see if it stopped on someone. It moved in this way, in this direction. I just have faith. Now how many seen the picture of the angel of the Lord here? We, we got it. And here it's in the books and so forth. Now that's what I was looking at just saying. It come from that way somewhere. It went around this way. Come around to this side. It always comes in a prayer line, always has, to my right side. That's the reason I bring the people that way. I never have a prayer line unless it comes to my right, coming left. Because that's always where he's standing. That's always where I've seen uh, on that side. And now, when it used to be, I brought the people from the left side when I caught them with that hand. But this way, it's a vision. He stands on this side. I'm, I'm ministering, brethren. I want you all to believe with all your heart. I want you to have faith. And look, look at those people. Now... Is God a father? How many believe that God is our father? It's the father of Jesus Christ. It's our father. We are adopted children. Now, he is a dove. How many believe that by the grace of God, you're his lamb? Raise up your hand. Fine. All right. Now, let's let him lead us. Now, I'll, I want to see in the audience someone so that you'll see it's not only the people here in the line. That's just, that's, you know why we give prayer cards? 
is so that the people won't rush over. See, there's, there's probably two or three more hundred people or four in here wants to be prayed for. And if you have discernment, brother, it's a jumping over one another in disorder. This, this is, is an arena, but it isn't tonight. It's a church tonight. The church of God is sitting in here. So we want everything just in order. You let it get out of order and watch how quick the Holy Spirit takes a flight. Oh, it's timid. You let someone start disbelieving. Just watch how it leaves me. Just, just as quick as it can. It won't. It just won't stay around where there's unbelief. It just won't do it. Very, very timid. That's the reason, my brother, my precious sisters. God bless your heart. Me speaking about women wearing that, that isn't you. That's these modern that do the way they do. But look, I'm just trying to warn you for your children coming on and things and, and watch every step. Don't you do that. Last night I seen up in this side and that side teenage girls, young ladies, going back now for salvation. How I appreciate that. My Right that crossroads of life. How gracious it is God to do that for us. Now, uh, is, did all of them get in? Is all the 50 there? There is somebody somewhere trying to have some faith out there somewhere. I just, I, there's no need. If I told you I could explain this, you cannot. How many knows that you can't explain God? That's the reason all of our trying and superstitions. In the Garden of Eden, there was two trees. How many knows that? One of them was a tree of life and the other was a tree of knowledge. And when man left the tree of life to eat the tree of knowledge, he always destroys himself. Separates himself from God. So you'll never know God by knowledge. You've got to know him by faith. Just to believe it. It doesn't come by knowledge. It's faith. See? So every time we bite here, they bit off first bite, separate his fellowship from his maker. Then he bit off gunpowder, kills his, his comrade, his friend. Next thing, he bit off an automobile, kills more than all the gunpowder. Now he's bit himself off with an atomic bomb. I wonder what he's going to do with that. See? God never destroys nothing. Man, by knowledge, destroys himself. Remember that. God doesn't destroy nothing. God's eternal. He doesn't destroy nothing. But man, by his knowledge, destroys himself. When we get to a place, you say, well, no, there's no such a thing as the Holy Ghost. Divine healing's wrong. Just remember, you're destroyed by your own ignorance. You think it's knowledge, but it's ignorance. So you, you destroyed yourself. You sent your soul plumb away from God by doing that, see? Why don't you just throw down your own thoughts and say, Oh, dove of God, come lead me. See? Watch where he brings you, right straight back to his word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, for seeth thou the mouth of God. Now I want to know how many in that prayer line that doesn't know me, and I, and you, I don't know you, that doesn't know me, raise up your hands. You that, how many out there that doesn't know me, raise up your hands. Up in the balconies and so forth, you see. All right? Now, there's only, as far as God being my judge, the only persons that I know, I have got acquainted with some of these precious brethren here, especially the chairman here, the uh, brother um, Hobson, and then I met uh, a couple more of the brothers that know them, and I shook all their hands, but brother, if I don't get to know you real well here, I know you cross the pond when we get over there. We'll, I'll be there with you. And we're ministers together. And some of you all was preaching this gospel when I was yet a little old sinner boy. Really, it needs to be you up here. But what is it? You cut down the bushes and, and leveled out the road that the running would be a lot easier for me than it was for you. So I want you to know that I know that in my heart. Some glorious day when we shake hands across the table over yonder, we'll see where the crown goes. You brother, you really fought to win the prize and made the road easy for me. You preach that these things would be coming long years ago. Before I was ever entered the ministry, you preached these things that happened. Now, see, you paved the road. These are the people you preach to that come here and see exactly. Always honor your pastor. He's worthy of every bit of honor you can give him. The Bible says that. Amen. Yes, sir. And don't muzzle the ox that treaded out the corn. Now, back long ago when he's down on the corner and run out of the city and eat corn off the railroad track or whatever they they is making the way for this and don't never forget that when these new evangelists come along with a ministry way don't remember if it's going to be operated on you want it, you wouldn't want to get a new student that hadn't had no experience you want one that had some experience how about your soul is going to be operated on yeah. mm. that's right brother sure is true Amen. now this is a gift let me explain it just for a moment now this is a gift 
just a, a way I have of just to give myself over to the dove. Then I don't use my own thinking, my own sight, my own words. I just relax before it. It's just a gift to know how to do it. And when it does, then that I, I, I'm relaxed right now. See? And each one of you is a spirit. If you wasn't, you'd be dead. So when you have an unbelief, I feel that coming in. A little bit of doubt, you feel it. Well, when there's faith, you feel that too. See? Well, now, it's your faith that brings these visions. Now, God knows that. It's your faith that does it, not me. I, I don't control it. It controls me. I just relax myself, and then whatever he does, I say it, to start getting real weak. And then I feel myself bumping up, then I just, uh, I know if I keep on, it won't be just a little bit, the, the, R- Brother Roy or Billy Paul here will get me. And so then I've got other meetings, other nights, and I try to pull myself out. Uh, it's, the, the gift isn't for me, it's for you. Yeah. I can, if I want to know something, I say, Lord, what is it, what is it? He don't tell me, unless he wants to. But when I relax myself by gift, then you can use it. Now, how many understands that? That's your own faith. Now, if you'll just look this way, like the woman that touched the border of his garment, and, and believe and know that he is a high priest, see? Now, the only way you'll ever get anything from a gift of God is to approach it with reverence and respect. What if Martha would have said, you wasn't here. Why do you come when I called you? My brother Lazarus has been dead four days. We believe you're a hypocrite. We would have had more to do with you. It would have never happened. What if that Seraphonician woman, when he said, she said, Lord, have mercy on my daughter. She's variously vexed with the devil. He said, it's not meat for me to take the children's bread and give it to you dogs. Whew. What would you have said? Me a dog? A holy roller, I ain't got nothing to do with you. Go on. Not her. She said, that's truth, Lord. But the, the dogs eat the scraps under the master's table. He turned around and said, for this same, her approach, see. Martha said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not die. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Uh-oh. He said, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said, Yea, Lord. She called him what he was, Lord. Yea, Lord. I believe that you are the Son of God that was to come into the world. Brother, something's got to happen. Amen. And so, where have you buried him? <laughs> that was it. That's what it takes to do it. That's what it takes to do it each time. Now, if you just approach God with that same reverence, you out there without a prayer card. I'll just pray for these in the line. Just to show you that at, uh, it'll be... I'm going to remember to get this watch off of I might be... I'll just pray for these people in the prayer line. And then you are the one to do the discerning. You just, you just believe with all your heart. Just believe with all your heart. I can tell you before the meeting ever starts, before the prayer line starts. You want to get rid of that asthmatic cough, lady? You believe that God will make you well? If you'll have faith and don't doubt, you can get over it. Right back here, there's a man sitting. And a man's got a heart trouble. Been in the hospital. If you'll believe, sir, with all your heart, God will heal you. Mr. Howard, have faith. Hallelujah. Sir, do you have a prayer card? You don't have no prayer card? I'm a stranger to you. I don't know you. never seen you in my life, and we're total strangers. Ever what that said, is that the truth? If it is, raise up your hand. All right? Jesus Christ makes you well. Now go home. You're healed. See what I mean? How are you feeling better now, sister? You'll stop that old coughing now and go home and be well. If thou canst believe why do you think, sir, back there with that leg trouble, you think that God will make you well and heal you? Young fellow sitting there looking at you, believe God will make you well? If you believe with all your heart, you can have it. Amen. Don't doubt. Believe. There's a lady sitting there praying for her husband. Got something wrong with his muscles. You believe that God will make him well? If you do, you can have what you ask for. If you believe it, don't doubt in all your heart. Stand up, ladies, so the people can see who you are sitting back there. All right? Just believe with all your heart. Look what it done to the woman. Look what it done to the man. Where are they? They're rams that let the dove come in. That's exactly what it is. Have faith in God. Come, lady. 
you believe me to be his prophet or his servant, I meant to say, that stumbles some people the reason I say that like I said. You believe it. We're strangers to one another. All right. We have never met before, and we, this is our first meeting in life. Now, I don't know you, you don't know me, and so here we are just for the first time meeting. I have no idea what's wrong with you. I have no idea why you're standing here. I, I could, it might be, you might be sick, you might be standing for somebody else, you might have financial troubles, it may be domestic troubles, it may be, I don't know what it is. You're aware of that, that I know nothing about. If that's so, as far as we know, raise up your hand so that people can see. See? Now, here we are. Now, see, it's just a relaxation. I'm going to talk to the woman. Now, there's a woman. I'm a man. And we have just met for the first time in life like Jesus and the woman at the well, the, at Samaria, the well. Now, he talked to her just a moment in order to catch her spirit. See? Because now it's just coming everywhere like a heartbeat. Everywhere. It's just the, the people. Now, I don't know you and God knows you and he knows me. Now, if God will reveal to me something like uh, Jesus told the woman what her trouble was. You remember reading that story, St. John 4? And he said, what her trouble was. And when she did, she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We know, we Samaritans, we know that the Messiah is coming, which is called the Christ. And when he comes, he'll tell us these things. She knew that was a sign of the Messiah. And so, and he said, I'm he that speaks to you. She ran into the city and told the man about it. Come see a man who told me the things have done. Isn't this the very Messiah? And the people in the city believed him to be Messiah because of the woman's testimony. Now, that's a scripture, isn't it? Our ministers, is that the scripture? All right. Now, you're the audience, and a woman don't have to come tell you. You're here to look at her. Now, will you believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, in the form of the Holy Ghost, is here working through us just like he promised to do in the Bible. Would you believe it? Then what would be to hinder you? Just say, I'm your lamb, you're the dove. Lead me to health, Lord. Now, don't say that he will. But see, now, here I have to approach that by faith. I have to approach it to believe it by faith now. He might not do it. Because for a moment, I want to talk and kind of get myself back again from the visions that happened in the audience. So if the people would see it wasn't a prayer line or anything that had nothing to do with it, you out there, just God's everywhere. Don't you believe it? He's omnipresent. Amen. The lady suffers with an arthritis. I see her trying to get out of the bed. It's worse of a morning than any time when you try to get up. Now, that's right. If that's right, raise up your hand. Now, she doesn't look like it, does she? But she's got it. What is it? That's, that's a vision. I saw her doing something. Trying, I believe it was moved from a bed or something. Now, that's right. Now, just be real reverent. The woman's saddened by some reason. I was going to pass her on. But there's something way down deep beyond that. That she's sad. You just remember, because around the woman is a sadness and a darkness. Oh, yes, it's some loved one, it's your husband, and he's in a hospital, a veteran's hospital, in a city called Walla Walla, Walla Walla, or something like that, that's right, he's got cancer, you're from Oregon, your name is Miss Lefferson, that is true. You can believe now with all your heart? Yes. Then go as you have believed, so be it unto you. All right, do you believe with all your heart? Just have faith. Don't doubt. Say, Lord, I believe with all that is within me. I believe. How many believe now with all your heart? Now, what's doing that? The dove. The dove. I be reverent. Just believe. Is this the next patient? You believe with all your heart? You believe that God... If I didn't say one thing to you, you believe that God would heal you? Come here. In the name of Jesus Christ, let this woman be healed for your glory. Amen. Now believe with all your heart. Have faith. You believe with all your heart? If I didn't say one thing to you, would you still believe it with all your heart? In the name of Jesus Christ, let this man be healed. Amen. Come believe. Now, you're aware that I know what's wrong with you. But if I didn't say nothing, would you believe with all your heart? Let me just show you something. Come here. 
Lay your hand on mine. This way. This way. Lay your hand on mine. Got a lady's trouble. Female trouble. See, I never caught that from vision. I caught it from here. Let me show you something. I look at my hand now. Just like an ordinary man's hand, isn't it? Here. Now take this hand put this hand over here. Still the same way. Now change your handkerchief. Put it over here. Now it's not. Turns red, swelled up, little white things running over. Now I just move your hand off. I put my hand just across like this. It isn't that way now. I used to lay that hand right back across there again. There it is again. Now you know something's going on there. And then the mysterious part, it tells you what's wrong with you. Now by vision, I could, if the Lord would right now, I could call a vision and if you could, ask God to, it would just go on and on. Now, watch this just a minute. You believe with all your heart now that you're going to be healed. Lord, have mercy on the woman. I charge this enemy by the name of Jesus Christ. I cast him out, come out of her. Now look at your other hand now. Something happened, didn't it? Now look, put this hand on now. That's the way you did. Now I put my hand on. Doesn't change a bit. Now let me have this hand again. Something happened, didn't it? You were healed. That's all. That's, all, that's just the way it is. Isn't he wonderful? <laughs> believe with all your heart. Now if I don't say a word, lay hands on you. You go to believe. In the name of Jesus Christ, may the man be healed. Amen. Come, sir. In the name of Jesus Christ, may the man be healed. Hallelujah. Come, sister. Believe with all your heart. Are you sad? You believe you're going to be healed? You do. All right. And uh, you believe it. Are they Spanish? Oh, uh, Japanese and what? Spanish. Spanish and Japanese. Huh? All right. Was you born here? Oh, I like it down there. Very nice. You um, you love the Lord? You think that diabetes is gone and you can go home and be well now? Yes. All right, then go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't say nothing, you'd bring us healed anyhow, would you? You would? But you, you want the, the back trouble to leave you so you can be well. In the name of the Lord Jesus, grant Lord, and you'll be healed. Go now and believe your kidneys will be all right. And you'll be well. All right, the reason that was so, so powerful there, your back too has been bothering you, so that's right. So you believe with all your heart now? If you believe with all your heart, you can go and believe in Jesus' name. All right, come. Now, you know I know what's wrong with you, so you believe I can tell you? you got several things wrong, but the main thing you want to pray for is your arthritis. Now, go on and be well. Just say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, you're aware that I, I know what's wrong with you, but if I tell you the main thing that you want me to pray for, would it help you? Your heart trouble. Just go believe. Just have faith. Don't doubt at all. You see what I mean, friend? It's a vision, but oh, that just nearly kills you. See? Do you believe he's here? Sure he's here. Now let's pray. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus, may she be healed. Amen. Go believing with all your heart. Now, sir, you must have faith. You know that. That cancer would kill you. But you believe that God's going to heal you that cancer and you're going to get one. I charge that cancer in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of you. Go believing. And if you'll have faith and believe with all your heart, you'll not die with heart trouble. You'll get well. You believe it? All right. Go believe it. Say praise the Lord. All right. You believe with all your heart? In the name of the Lord Jesus, may she be healed. Amen. Believe me. For the little one, if I lay hands on it, will it get well? In the name of Jesus Christ, may the baby be healed. Amen. Don't doubt. It'll be all right. Have faith. Mercy. Brother, you've got to believe or it'll, it'll eat right on in. But you believe it'll be all right? In the name of Jesus Christ, may it, the devil leave the man. Amen. Have faith. Believe. You believe for him now, sir? Come here, little boy. Lord, heal the little boy. Granted, as I take him in my arms and lay hands on him in commemoration of what Jesus did to the little children, may he be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. I go no I come, sir. Father God, I pray that you'll heal this man. May this condition leave him in Jesus' name. Amen. Have faith. I just believe with all. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sister be healed. Amen. All right, come, sir. You want to believe? In the name of Jesus Christ, may my brother be healed. Amen. Have faith. Now, don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. All right, come, lady. What's this quiet about? 
Did you know God just blessing each one if I didn't think it, I'd stop them. Yeah. See? It's going on just the same. Yeah. It's just, you, you, you see, the thing of it is, you see there's, how many knows there's got to be something besides Brother Branham doing that? Raise up your hand. You know I couldn't do it. Well, then there's some kind of anointing here. Is that right? Do you believe it to be what the Bible said? Do you believe that? Well, then, did that same Jesus that make that promise, that same dove, did not he say, if they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover? The vision just nearly, it just nearly kills me, see? How many understands the Bible teaches that? Well, sure, anybody knows the Bible knows that. It just, I can't stop for each one. But if you do, you must know that God's just the same. The, the, the Holy Spirit, when he spoke to me up there, if you'll just give me a moment's time to get myself back a little bit. He said, you were born to pray for sick people. Your peculiar birth, that light that you see on that picture was hanging over my cradle when I was born. Born on a little straw tick with a shuck pillow. My mother was 15 years old. My dad was 18. Five o'clock in the morning, they didn't have a window in the house. They had a little door. I don't know where you ever seen. How many of you ever seen one little, like supposed to be like a window, but it's just a little door you open up. And, and that angel of God at five o'clock in the morning, April the 6th, 1909, at five o'clock in the morning, come right in and stood over that little bed where I was laying. They didn't know what. My people before me were Catholic. And so there was no Catholic churches up there. And so they take me over to a little Baptist church. And there I made my first visit to a church. The Baptist church is called Possum Kingdom Baptist Church. Possum Kingdom Baptist Church. And that's where I made my first visit to a church. And from when I was about two years old, the first vision come. From that it's come on and on and on and on. And I'm 51 years old now. So you see... It's, it's the visions. When he told me, he said, you were born for this purpose, to pray for sick people. I said, they won't believe me. He said, as Moses was given two signs, you're given two signs. He said, one of them is take the people by the hand. And don't use your thinking. See? He said, it'll be told you what's wrong. Well, I did that. I watched how things went for a while, watching people. And then I told you, well, this other would take place. Now you see, it's taking place. Now the next thing's coming in. See? Perhaps be all mostly overseas because of feeling pulling overseas. Now, that you might know that it is God. It's him. It's this brother, sister. That vision, that angel, God in heaven knows that's true. What good would it do me to stand out here telling you people these things? I, I don't get paid for it. You know that. My church pays me. My love offerings is overseas missions. I asked the secretary here. I, that's right. See, I never see it. It goes for overseas. I go there and preach the gospel over in other countries. The expenses is paid. The brother and the chairman them can tell you, I don't get money. I, I don't have it. I get $100 a week from my church. Well, I get that just staying home, going fishing every day and pastoring the church on Wednesday night and Sunday morning. See, they're a little Baptist tabernacle. That, it ain't money. If it won't be money, I could have been a millionaire. If I'd wanted to be, a, I was given a million five hundred thousand dollars in one offering one time. Not a, from one person. That's right. FBI agents brought it to me. I got the piece out of the paper. And they, I said, I even refused to look at it. I said, I wouldn't have it. No, sir. I don't want it. So what am I standing out here for? Why am I home, have my family and everything much better off and live a life like that instead of gone from the family and a toil and a weary and a cry and a pull and a persuade? It's because that I got a commission. I must do it. Amen. Many times doubters, people raising up, and, and people saying, oh, it's nothing to it. That, that's a whole lot that hurts, you see. But just the same, that, I don't ask for a flower bed of ease. I expect it. Yes, sir, I must fight if I must reign. Yes, sir, I've got it to do. Our Lord did. So I'm here to try to help you. And the best that I know how, I'm trying to help you. And please believe me. If I tell anything and God backs it up and says it's truth, the Bible said to hear him because I'm with him. Is that right? Amen. Now, I'm telling you that each one of you can be healed. You are already healed if you just recognize it. Right. Now, who is next? This woman here? Here, like this lady here. Now, look, lady, we are strangers to one another. I do not know you, but you know that I know what's wrong with you. Yeah. If I didn't say nothing about it, yet you believe you'd be healed anyhow? Yeah. You do? That's, that's the way to believe it. That's the way you have complications. Several things wrong with you. That's right. You're stiffening up your joints. Been that way for quite a while. I see a crash. Or, oh, it's an automobile accident. Cause that. That's thus saith the Lord. Is that the truth? Raise up your hand if that's the truth. See? Praise the Lord. It's, he's just the same yesterday and forever. Don't you believe that? In Jesus' name, go and be made well. Come, my brother. In the name of Jesus, go and be made well. 
become my sister. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, let the spirit that's on me anoint the woman, Lord. Amen. Praise God in Jesus' name, may they be healed. Hallelujah. Amen. Come, brother. In Jesus' name, may they be healed. You'll believe it. Then your back trouble will leave. Your asthma will leave. You believe that? You got a habit you want to leave. Smoking cigarettes. You give them up? Amen. With all your heart? If I tell you who you are, you think it's really gone, then won't it? Mr. Cunningham, go on your own and rejoice. Thank you, Lord. Do you believe with all your heart? Now put your hands over on one another. All of you in here. Oh, 